As an animator, director, and producer, his name appeared on Disney films as Wolfgang Reitherman. But since his earliest years, he's been known as Wooly. And since his earliest years, Wooly Reitherman has had a taste for action. I started flying when I was about 16. In those days, you didn't even need a license. And uh, a couple of friends of mine got killed, and that kind of jars you up a little bit. In World War II, he piloted supplies over the dangerous route from Burma to China. And like a young Hemingway, he loved the mountains and the sea. I used to love the ocean. And it kind of teaches you something. Uh, if, if it's bigger than you, curl up and, and let it happen and don't try to anticipate it. And those things that really take you along. Sometimes it, if there was an undertow, you had to come quite a ways around, which taught you to, to uh, not, not to panic. Willie Ratherman never panicked. After Walt Disney's death, Disney animation was like a plane without power. Ratherman became the pilot in the hot seat. Sovereign and sassafras. Action and danger were Willie Ratherman's trademarks. You can share his sense of adventure here in the Disney Family Album. Willie Reitherman started animating for Disney in 1933. I was sort of recruited out of art school. And I really didn't want to go to Disney's because I'd heard you made drawings over and over and over. His first assignment, the magic mirror in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, didn't really give him a chance to spread his wings. What wouldst thou know, my queen? It was kind of tough because uh, uh, it was held. Someone was talking like this all the time. Now, in animation, what you do is you phrase something, and you, you talk this way, and then you cock your head over this way, and it gives it a feeling of life. I did that thing over three, four, five times. I finally devised a way of, of splitting the head in half by folding the paper. And I'd draw one half of the, of the expression, then I would fold the paper over and draw the other half right on the same line and, and the same thing so that you, so that it, it, did, it didn't jiggle all over the place. And uh, that finally worked. It got me out of a hole. Lips red as the rose, hair black as ebony, skin white as snow. Snow white. In the 1930s, Wooly and the other young Disney artists learned how to make their animation imitate life. They did it by observing life in places like the nearby Griffith Park Zoo. I think a lot of the time we didn't know what we were striving for, but we knew that observation of life and building a vocabulary of observation about animals and so on uh, gave us a better understanding about movement in general and of course we were all eager and we were compulsive drawers and it was great fun to come over here and draw and bring your lunch and whatever and uh, bring a pretty girl over the animators knew that their work would have to come alive on the screen but this was no simple task the flower of this medium was to to be able to to instill life into a drawing and uh that meant it had to move. It, uh, a painting is there and it does have a feeling of life, but it's caught in one instant, so is a, f a photograph. But until it moves, life really doesn't get into that thing called a screen up there until it, until it moves and moves with meaning and, and making statements. Uh, it's not alive. I want to be a man, man cub, and stroll right into town and be just like the other men. I'm tired, I'm walking around. Careful analysis of movement became the bedrock of Woolley's animation style.
We used to watch uh, film at night, usually the newsreels of sports, like horse racing and boxing, and we'd stop the film, you know. And we didn't know really what we were looking for, but we observed that at certain phases, certain things seemed to happen. Well, if I'm going to animate an animal, say, running, of course, you've got to have a kind of an appearance that's the right animal. That with the horse, you knew that the back end of the horse was doing the, the driving. Those back, those back feet. And you knew that there was a kind of a series of leaps. So what I'm saying is you'd, you'd start out with the, with the front feet, and you knew that they didn't come out this way and do this. You knew that there was an overlap. So you'd start out, and the, the head would be down, and would come out and reach. And this other foot was getting ready for the other reach. Now you'd come, you'd come down, and these two feet would hit. And now you knew that the weight of the body was now on those two feet. So finally, if you'd go through that straight ahead, and after all well, the first stride or two, you'd really, you'd really have something that worked, and it was alive. By the time Fantasia went into production in 1938, Woolley understood movement so well he could animate animals that in real life were extinct. The beginning of analysis of movement, action analysis, of course, is the skeleton. And you go, we went down to the museum and we saw these big, these big animals on bones, and they're absolutely authentic. And you could, you could kneel and 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 try to figure how they would get all that weight from one foot to the other, how the bones would articulate and then of course the other thing is to draw them so they're always above you you, you don't you don't look level at a, at a big thing you always have to look up at it to really get the full personality of a wild animal it has to be chased by something or it has it has to be in danger in real mortal danger which 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 uh, I guess it's like watching a bullfight in a way but it's very exciting Using what he knew about anatomy, Woolley also exaggerated movement to comic proportions as with the crocodile in Peter Pan. Oh, I know some of the guys criticized me for there's no crocodile in the world that a man can, can stand straight up in and hold the jaws apart <laughs> like that. I says, nobody's going to care about that if it's funny. The incredible bulk of this rhino made it perfect for a bit part in Robin Hood. We needed these these uh, powerful tank-like creatures that would just form a phalange and just rip through everything. And uh, uh, that was a, just a one-dimensional beast in a, in a way. Of course, we put clothes on them, gave them spears. Also in Robin Hood, Willie cast the King of the Beasts as a neurotic Prince John. I am king, king, king. Ah, off with his head. Well, that's a different reason for using a lion. It was a cowardly lion, and the lion is a, a symbol of, of regal, of king. And of course, he wasn't a king, and he was a scroungy lion and a sneaky lion. And it gave you a, a real good character. And then, of course, uh, with Peter Ustinov's voice, you couldn't miss. Oh, the richest plum of them all. Notting. <laughs> Ham. This crown gives me a feeling of power. Power. Forgive me a cruel chuckle. <laughs> power.